Christian. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to extend a welcome to all who are joining us for this webinar. Um, it's hard to think of a, a title which would better encapsulate the spirit of the foundation of ISE, whose anniversary these webinars celebrate religion, peace and conflict in Ireland and beyond. And thanks to Jin's uh, steering hand, we've had a very lively series of webinars addressing important topics, gathering not only distinguished panelists, but many engaged participants. And this I'm sure will be no less uh, interesting and engaging than those which have gone before. Certainly it couldn't be more topical and timely. We have in these days been celebrating the octave of prayer for Christian unity. We've marked the centenary of the Irish Council of Churches and we're still celebrating 50 years of ISE. And in these uh, webinars, bringing together academics and practitioners in a shared reflection on key challenges of our time. And we are fortunate to have to, this evening uh, a very distinguished panel of contributors. And I know their contributions will uh, encourage your questions and responses. So without further delay, I'm very pleased to hand over to Jude Lal, who will introduce our speakers and moderate our discussion. Thank you very much, Dermot. Thank you very much, um, Chin. And we are very grateful to all the panelists who kindly agreed to give their time and energy. Uh, and you all are very welcome to this webinar on religion, conflict and peace in Ireland and beyond. As we are aware, at the heart of the conflict in the island of Ireland, we find a particular understanding of what it means to be religious. There is no one single understanding of what it is to be religious. There are multiple understandings, some more contentious, others more reconciliatory. And we have a very imminent panel of speakers today, both from Ireland and other parts of the world, which are conflict zones. We want to make these connections with Ireland and other parts of the world, which strive towards just peace. And I will introduce each of the speakers when it comes to their turn. And its speaker in the first round, as it was notified, will speak for five minutes in the first round, and then we'll go for the second round. And again, five minutes each. In the first round, the speakers will identify the challenges that we can find in the interplay of religion, conflict, and peace in their particular context, because there is no transhistorical, transcultural, or decontextualized understanding of any religion, or even any peace, any conflict. That is why we want to get speakers from different contexts through which we can learn uh, mutually. And I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Leslie Carroll, who is from Northern Ireland. She's a Presbyterian minister. She is currently the prisoner ombudsman for Northern Ireland, and of course, an alumni of the Irish School of Ecumenics, Trinity College, Dublin. Thank you very much, Leslie, for accepting our invitation. It's over to you now. Thank you, Jude, and hello, everyone. Um, five minutes, uh, we'll see how it goes. I, um, I had some difficulty mustering my thoughts. It was both a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, a challenge, I think, to pin something down in the chaos of my head, which reflects, reflects the chaos of the world in which we live, um, and an opportunity because it, it focused, focused me, and I hope it helps us all to think together about what we can actually do, what opportunities present themselves. Challenges are, of course, much easier to comment on than opportunities. Um, but at the same time, every challenge is an opportunity. And perhaps that is somewhere of the focus of uh, the challenge of our times, the world that we live in. 
a challenge around an attitudinal approach in relation to what an opportunity is. We live in a world and I live in a and on a part of this island where there is considerable focus on the difficulties, the challenges, what do we need to get done, what's wrong, um, what does my community need? And much less focus on what's the opportunity of this moment, what's the opportunity of the challenge we are in. And I suppose it would be fair then to ask opportunity for what? I was uh, reminded of Proverbs 29 verse 18, which in old familiar versions says, where there is no vision, the people perish. I think there's a challenge and an opportunity for vision making, challenging the persisting vision at national and also more local levels. Currently, the vision is something like dog eat dog, look after your own, don't worry about others as long as we're okay make ourselves great. Um, in my part of this island, uh, I'm connected to Britain and we are making Britain great. Make ourselves great, never mind anybody else. It's a self-obsessed public narrative with little to commend it in my view. And it's not built on a vision, never mind a faith-based vision. In Northern Ireland, our public narrative is also one of loss. No one has got what they want. And 25 years on from the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, there's even more sense of that loss. Rather than the benefits embedding into our psyches to predominate in the public narrative and debate, it's the losses that have embedded themselves at this point. We know we have a natural human bias towards the negative, which back in the day, somewhere near the beginning of time, served us well. Our survival skills had to be honed so that literally we could survive, for example, in the land of the dinosaurs. We have a natural, automatic human tendency to the negative, to assessing the negative, to dominate our actions and reactions. So anyone trying to construct a positive narrative will always face a greater challenge. I'm talking about that, but I'm talking about more than that negative human bias. I'm talking about deep rooted feelings of loss in Northern Ireland, and those feelings are gathering into new narratives 25 years on from the agreement. New narratives about the protocol and the assembly. Uh, I mean, the um, Stormont Assembly, not the Presbyterian General Assembly. Uh, that's a whole other narrative altogether. Um, so those those negative narratives are gathering and, and my greatest fear, I suppose, is that we're going to end up with a scenario in which we have a unionist community dissatisfied with the protocol agreement when it's reached. And that means we'll have a ruling system uh, which dissatisfies the nationalist Republican community. Um, so we'll have two communities who have lost even more. It's likely to be true in other places as well. Think of Bosnia where uh, things are not quite as stable as they used to be. So there's a challenge around the type of narrative and an opportunity there. And then there's a challenge about how we do, uh, how we get ourselves involved in that public narrative in this kind of solar plexus living world that we are in. Challenges coming from within our own communities where we self-restrict and the mainline denominations, Christian denominations in this part of the island do that particularly well. Um, uh, so we're not particularly well he heard in the public uh, domain. And many have come to believe that we in the Christian churches are nothing but persecuted. Maybe only a small number believe that, but the impact of a small vocal group on a whole denomination can be significant and out of proportion to the size of that group. So there's a challenge in all of that to construct a vision. How do we get that vision out of the denominations given this sense of persecution? And it's important because as Proverbs tells us, people are perishing. Some versions put that verse in Proverbs differently. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. That brings me to a stark reality, the reality of violence, of domination of neighbors, of care for some, and the significant exclusion of others. So that for me is something of the challenge and the opportunity it's a challenge and opportunity that, that comes to faith communities, to us as people who have not been able to engage in the public square in the way in which I think we did 25 years ago. 
And that challenge is added to by the missing understanding of theological and biblical ideas in the public debate. And maybe I'll say more about that in a while. OK, Jude, that's long enough, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much for that succinct and, you know, uh, lucid um, uh, presentation, Leslie. You focused on a particular kind of a narrative and also the accumulated uh, sense of loss and uh, the self-pride or the collective pride which are posing challenges to move beyond the negative uh, past towards uh, a, a positive, more optimistic future. Uh, let's focus on the latter part in the second round. And I would like to thank you very much for that. And thank you. Uh, the next uh, speaker will be Dr. Michael Keller. He's a redemptorist priest from Isle, the island of Ireland and was the former provincial of his congregation. The redemptorist religious community worked both in the north and south of the island of Ireland and has produced great pioneers of peace and reconciliation in, in the island, like Father Alec Reed. Thank you for accepting our invitation, Michael. It's your turn now. Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to be here with you. Uh, I wonder, there we are. Um, so this time I'm going to offer a perspective, a Catholic redemptorist Clannard perspective on the topic. And in the next five minutes, I'll talk a little bit about Father Alec Reed's uh, lessons from the streets. So the redemptorist presence in Belfast um, is most significantly in Clannard Monastery off the Falls Road. Uh, Clannard Monastery was built in 1890, and I suppose that longevity is, is important. And it has been called the cradle of the peace process. Uh, it's situated, for those who know Belfast, right beside the peace line. Um, some people say walls have uh, ears. In, in Belfast, many walls have mouths. Um, there's lots of graffiti um, on, on walls and on peace lines in Belfast uh, that, that speak. The Redemptorists founded in 1732, founded in Italy. So I'm a member of a religious congregation uh, living on the peace line in Belfast since the late 1800s. So some challenges, uh, there's challenging history, two peoples on one island, an indigenous people, a settler people. So the last several hundred years have, have been challenging history-wise. So two different cultures, uh, Celtic culture and English Scottish culture, uh, a Catholic tradition, a Protestant tradition, or Protestant traditions, uh, difficult or different political aspirations, a nationalist and republican or unionist loyalist uh, political perspective. In the 1920s, there was partition, and there was a redemptorist in 21 uh, in failed peace talks, uh, an Archbishop Clune, who was based in Australia. There were cycles of violence. These were all part of the challenging history of that part of, of the world. Um, lots of deaths, thousands of deaths, lots of psychological, physical damage, lots of households affected, most households affected. One in three persons of all ages directly or indirectly affected. So lots of challenges and the churches, the people of faith caught on, on both sides of this a uh, very challenging history. So as a Clannard Redemptorist and uh, as a Catholic perspective, there were opportunities that offered. Um, and one opportunity was Charman. A Charman in, in Irish history is a place of asylum, a place of refuge, a sanctuary, a safe place, a place of dialogue. And so Clannard was conceived of as a place of Charman, of sanctuary. And two significant people lived in the community there in the, uh, particularly in the late 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and noughties. Um, one of those was uh, Alec Reed, who uh, died 10 years ago this year. And he's probably most remembered for that photograph that you saw there. Father Reed saw an opportunity 
to be a servant of Christ in a situation of conflict. So there was an opportunity uh, to provide a charman, a safe space, a sanctuary, but there was also an opportunity to be a servant of Christ in a situation of conflict. And the first and most crucial activity was to listen. And we'll come back to that in the lessons from the street in the second five minutes. Uh, that is uh, Father Reid, uh, having given the, the kiss of life uh, to one of the corporals who died in 1988. So he was involved in the decommissioning with Reverend Harold Good. He was uh, also uh, present at the, um, uh, at the Belfast Agreement. Um, we'll come back to his lessons from the street in the next five minutes, but some personal attributes, some opportunities for people of perseverance, for people who can be companion or who are able to build relationship. And there are opportunities for, for people who can work behind the scenes, who are trustworthy and not all of the time looking for headlines. Um, so there are different roles and I'm teaching my grandmother how to suck eggs here for, for people of faith, pastoral, prophetic, uh, reconciliation roles, building bridges roles. Uh, one of the things that Father Alec and, and others in my Catholic Redemptorist tradition would try to avoid is too much wagging of the finger. Um, maybe a little more listening and a little less wagging of the finger uh, from church folk. One of those who was a pilgrim for, for, um, for peacemaking was, was Jerry Reynolds, uh, another member of that community from the 1980s until he died. And that's five minutes over. Good. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Um, uh, Leslie uh, talked about how challenges can also be opportunities, and you very clearly pointed out how those opportunities were available and how they were really utilized, like in the person of Father Alec Reed. And thank you so much for that. And our next speaker, the third speaker, is uh, Professor Mitri Raheb. Uh, he is uh, a Lutheran pastor uh, from Palestine and is the president of Dar al Kalima University in Bethlehem and is one of the most uh, prolific Palestinian liberation theologians who has published immensely. And thank you, Mitri, for accepting our invitation this evening. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Jude, and um, good evening, everyone. It's great to be uh, among uh, uh, scholars and friends uh, uh, this evening. Uh, actually, I would like to highlight uh, two challenges that uh, we face uh, as uh, Palestinian Christians, uh, uh, not only these days, but uh, this is almost uh, now chronic. The first challenge has to do with Christian Zionism. Um, you know, it is interesting, um, I mean, thinking of the topic, uh, you know, of um, religion, conflict, and peace in Ireland and beyond. You know, Christian Zionism actually um, really uh, has uh, many roots in the Christian tradition. But uh, in the 19th century, it was uh, triggered uh, by an Anglo-Irish pastor, uh, John Darby, uh, who thought that uh, for Christ to come back, uh, a kingdom of Israel should be established in Palestine. Now it's, you know, nice for... Uh, a British Irish, uh, uh, Anglo uh, Irish person uh, to, uh, to promise uh, Palestine to his fellow European Jews and this way to get rid of them. Uh, 
And um, actually this made history because uh, this became a few years later, uh, official British uh, policy. Uh, and, um, you know, Balfour, uh, as you know, uh, promised uh, Palestine then as a homeland for the Jewish people, though the Jewish people at that time were 5% of the population and the native Palestinians, both Christians and Muslims, were 95%. So I always like to say that it wasn't the Lord God who promised Israel the land, it was the Lord Balfour, which really means this was uh, a deal of an empire uh, uh, and not uh, something that has to do with religion. Now, uh, I, I think the, the question that now I'm dealing with a lot is, how do we understand uh, Christian Zionism? And I think uh, for a long time, people were thinking these are like crazy Christian who, you know, take few uh, uh, verses from the Bible and they read it in a very weird way. But actually, I would like to see uh, or, or to re redefine Christian Zionism. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 I, I, I would like to redefine it yeah. as a Christian political lobby that supports the Jewish settler colonialism of Palestinian land by using biblical and theological constructs within a meta narrative while taking global, will mean global and local consideration into account. So this definition basically is less focused on biblical discourse of Christian Zionism, which can vary considerably because we have literalist Christian Zionists, but also we have post-Holocaust liberal Christian Zionist theologians. But we look here at, not at what they think, but what they do. And what they do basically is they support uh, a settler colonial project of Palestinian land, uh, which is not their land. Uh, and uh, they think by doing so, they are doing God a favor, not the Jewish people, because at the end of the day, Christian Zionists really, they don't love the Jewish, uh, Jewish people. They want to get rid of them because even in their idea of Armageddon, they would like to see two thirds of the Jews somehow perish when they return to Palestine or when they come to Palestine, because they are not returning. They are coming as settlers for the first time. Uh, and, uh, and the third, third of Jews will then convert to, Christians, to Christianity. So basically they are calling for the annihilation of, the, of Judaism uh, in the name of Christian Zionism. Uh, and, uh, you know, these people uh, today are spread not only in Europe uh, or North America, but actually across the world. We have them very much in Latin America in Africa and in Asia. Uh, and uh, they actually support all of these popular uh, world leaders that we have today. If it's Trump uh, in the US, if it is uh, Bolsonaro um, in Brazil, uh, etc. Now, the second challenge actually is uh, Jewish Zionism. As you know, a month ago, uh, a new Israeli government was formed. Uh, Netanyahu and actually uh, the uh, Jewish uh, Zionist uh, groups, two Jewish uh, Zionist groups. Uh, and if we read actually uh, what um, what what this uh, uh, what uh, what uh, what is the program of this new uh, government? Um, uh, it's uh, really scary uh, what they what they have in mind because if you read it, they are saying that uh, uh, that it is only uh, Jews who have exclusive and unquestionable right to historic Palestine, which means Muslims and Christian Arabs have no rights to be in historic Palestine. This is their official uh, uh, agreement. And the second thing is that 
they say they are committed to build uh, Jewish colonies in all of Palestine, all of historic Palestine, including the West Bank, meaning in Bethlehem where I live, where today Bethlehem is anyhow uh, surrounded by 22 uh, Jewish settlements who control 86% of Bethlehem County, leaving to the native Palestinian people only 14% of our land for our own use. So these are the two challenges that really are not only making our life uh, uh, sour, but who are really making sure that there will be no peace uh, in this region uh, because settler colonialism and the difference between settler colonialism and uh, you know, uh, traditional colonialism is that in settler colonialism, settler, they come to stay and to replace the native people, to push them out of their land. And to do that, they have to actually create uh, a, a military uh, system that exclude people from everything and control every life. So that just this morning, um, Israeli troops entered into one refugee camp in the north of Palestine and killed nine people, assassinated them. And this is done on daily basis. It is like a Jim Crow time in Palestine. And again, they have impunity because the empires are backing them. I mean, Britain never actually apologized for what they did in Palestine, for promising Palestine uh, the way they did. Uh, and so these are really, we are facing an empire. That's our challenge. And this empire uh, weaponizes uh, religion for their own political end of settler colonialism uh, and uh, uh, white supremacy, if you want. So these are the challenges. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Mitri. Uh, you connected the dots uh, in the first instance. And secondly, most importantly, you gave us a broad framework uh, in, in, in the uh, notion and the reality of the empire. And that helps us uh, to engage in a deeper conversation across the borders. And our next speaker uh, is Professor Magali do Nascimento Cunha from Brazil. She's worked as a professor in religious studies in the Methodist universities of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. She's a journalist and is currently working as a general editor of the Rea Collective, a website that confronts religious fake news in Brazil. We truly appreciate your time and energy given to this webinar. Magali, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's uh, very happy to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Greetings from a warm Rio, Rio de Janeiro. And I prepared a short paper to help me to keep the five minutes given. Since 2013, Brazil has experienced the insurgency of far-right movements that led to the election of Jair Bolsonaro in 2018. It's not an exclusively Brazilian case, but it's placed in a broad context of intensification of the extreme right in all continents. Bolsonaro did not inaugurate the process of radicalization, extremism. He consolidated and deepened these elements that have roots in Portuguese colonization in the, 20, in the 16th century and more recently in the military dictatorship which lasted 21 years and left deep marks of authoritarianism and anti-human rights militarism. Bolsonaro made use of the state apparatus to propagate and finance hatred and intolerance allied with capital, which has resulted in a lack of peace. Brazil is experiencing a high degree of verbal, symbolic, and physical violence 
and learned with great difficulty to deal with the domestic terrorism that emerged in period. Bolsonarismo in power was developed under three main bases. One, micropolitics, with the establishment of projects to remove the rights of historically subordinate nations, women, people, indigenous people, residents of peripheric areas, people with disabilities, workers, the scrapping of public education and health systems, the unbridled exploitation and environmental resources, militarization and intensification of police brutality, weaponry and a culture of self-defense to the end of the right to public safety. Among the most terrible consequences for the lives of the people are almost 700,000 deaths from COVID-19, official numbers unreported, deforestation and destruction of forests and rivers, humanitarian health crisis among indigenous peoples with high numbers of dead, disease and malnourished people among many other dramatic situations. There are discursive strategies also to capture support from the population and more radical followers. Use of digital media by the government, extreme right-wing vehicles and press professionals also to spread disinformation and moral panic. Not just the popularly called fake news, but an entire ecosystem of disinformation very isolated to convince and capture heights and minds of support, creating what we classify as Bolsonarista sect with a high degree of fanaticism. Brazil has become a laboratory for far-right movements for this purpose. Support is captured especially by fear connecting it to everything that represents the defense of human rights, old images of an alleged communist domination by China, Venezuela, and Cuba, which would control especially freedom of property, religion, and freedom of expression, speech, and movement. In these discursive strategies, two convince elements are strong. Populism, with the use of popular rhetoric by the leaders presented as simple, sincere, committed with the people, and the use of religious work and symbols that are fundamentally Christian and the position of other religious expression is part of the digital strategy. In this context, and I'm going to, to the end of my presentation, it is in this context that a Christian right was formed and became fundamental in supporting Bolsonaro's government. This Christianized right is based on dominion theology to justify the signs of God in the chosen leader, inversion of gospel values, such as equality, solidarity, mercy, and selfishness, uh, uh, classifying them as synonymous with communism in order to, in this way, tune political religion to the culture of individualism and the neoliberal logic of innovation and entrepreneurship. Emphasis in the discourse, us versus them, enemies, radical defense of pro-life and pro-family agendas as opposition to sexual and reproductive, reproductive rights, assimilation of the armamentist discourse and the language of self-defense and revenge based on the Bible. All this is strongly based on Christian Zionism as my friend Mitri has just presented, and on the figure of a mythical Israel, mistakenly related to the contemporary state of Israel. So Lula's victory last year represents a deliverance from Brazil. We can't imagine what would become the country with another other four years under the government of Jair Bolsonaro. However, right-wing extremism is entrenched as evidenced by the incitement promoted by Bolsonaro and the lies against the election result with false allegations of fraud, which 
provoked the violence riots in December and here in January in the capital. There is a lot to do to overcome this process, and I will be sharing about opportunities next time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magali, for that short but very detailed and insightful account of what's unfolding uh, in, in Brazil, which has resonances with the, with the other context that we are discussing. And uh, on the panel, our last speaker of the first round is Professor Neville Cox uh, from the Republic of Ireland. He's the Registrar of Trinity College Dublin and is Professor of Law and a Barrister. Neville has research on the highly contentious relationship between freedom of speech and religious freedom, particularly in the context of increasing Islamophobia in Europe. Thank you very much, Neville, for accepting our invitation. It's your turn. Thanks very much, Jude. It's lovely to be here. I, I, I'm, I suppose, the one lawyer on the panel, which <clears throat> I don't take as a compliment to myself. Uh, but what I'd like to speak about, because I've only got five minutes and obviously speaking about the position of Islamophobia in Europe, uh, you need a great deal more about that. So I want to, to focus on one particular aspect of this, which I think is contentious, which is the mainstreaming <clears throat> within uh, Western European states of Islamophobic messages. I'm moving beyond Ireland here. You don't see this particularly happening in Ireland. Uh, see it more in Central Europe. And I want to just raise this as a particular issue of concern. I think it arises in two specific contexts. <clears throat> the message, which is uh, messages rather, which are handed out, are that inherently uh, Islam is a violent religion, uh, drawing uh, inherent connections between Islam and terrorism. Uh, <clears throat> that Islam is also a religion which sits outside and refuses to integrate in any sense into normal or orthodox uh, European ways of doing things. Uh, and also that Islam is, as a religion, inherently, and through its teachings and through its law, is inherently disrespectful of human rights. The mainstreaming of these messages has naturally a very substantial impact. Uh, insofar as Western European zeitgeist is concerned, there is a clear social ideal. Uh, and some of the things which will most threaten this, particularly post 9-11, are first of all engaging in violence or engaging in acts of terrorism, however you define them. Uh, secondly, disrespect for women's rights. And thirdly, in particular, disrespect for concepts of gender equality, which are such ingrained and settled norms within Western Europe. In other words, if you can mainstream the message that an entire religion through its teachings disrespects these norms, naturally you're presenting the entire religion and therefore all members of the religion as pariahs, as backward, uh, and as people who really shouldn't be taken seriously insofar as the European idea is concerned. And this is hugely problematic because population statistics indicate that the Islamic presence, the Muslim presence uh, in Europe is growing substantially. Uh, and is becoming a really recognizable uh, minority group within the population of most European countries. So how does this mainstream happen? Uh, I think it happens in a number of ways, but two are of particular concern so far as my research is, is, is concerned. The first is in relation to the so-called blasphemy scandals, which have happened in Europe over the last uh, couple of decades. I'm thinking particularly here of the Danish cartoon scandal, uh, and the reaction uh, to this, but the same probably goes for what happened in the context of the attacks on the Charlie Hebdo offices. If we take the Danish uh, cartoon scandal, you remember in 2005, there was a publication of 12 cartoons in Danish and uh, a Danish uh, newspaper, all of which depicted the Prophet Muhammad. Now, the reaction to this was really interesting. First of all, all of these cartoons were linked by the fact that at one level or another, they connected the prophet to terrorism, the most famous one being the prophet of the turban with a fuse at the end of it. In doing so, they implied that the entire religion was connected to terrorism, and therefore by implication that followers of the religion were connected to terrorism. And yet when there was objection to this, the focus of European media was not on the reasonableness of the arguments which people made, this amounted to incitement to religious hatred, 
but rather the focus was on the possibility that the reaction of Muslims to these cartoons was itself violent. Again, there was a mainstreaming and a relatively subtle mainstreaming of the message that in fact this religion, which is frankly a religion of peace, that this religion is inherently violent and people need not look beyond this. Why would we take these people seriously? Secondly, you're seeing an increasing number of European countries which are prohibiting the wearing in either oral contexts or specific contexts of certain forms of Islamic uh, garment by women, and naturally it's targeting women. Whether this be face veils or in some contexts, uh, headscarves. And in the national parliaments, which uh, are passing these laws which prohibit these uh, garments, the justifications for these laws tend to be twofold. First of all, that these garments are inherently uh, um, repressive of women, despite the fact that all the statistics throughout Europe show that women wear them voluntarily, something which the legislatures of national states have never really engaged with. Or alternatively, that these garments are worn as a disguise for someone who wishes to commit a terrorist atrocity. That, in other words, if one wears a face veil, <clears throat> one can commit a terrorist atrocity in a European country and escape the consequences through a disguise. Now, if we look at this in any detail, this is a nonsensical proposition. If I want to commit a terrorist attack in Europe and don't want to be uh, spotted for it, I'm much more likely to wear a hoodie and sunglasses than I am to wear the one garment which in a European country is more likely than any other to draw attention to myself. There is also absolutely no evidence <clears throat> that any of these uh, garments have been used by people who are engaged in terrorist offences. Nonetheless, by passing a law, and a law incidentally, which is never enforced in these countries, uh, passing a law and suggesting during the legislative process that this is urgently necessary to protect women uh, and to prevent terrorist attacks, the message is very clearly mainstreamed that the garment is worthy of this degree of urgent attention. And once again, it leads to a residual impact on popular attitudes towards Muslims. You know, Muslims force their women to wear these clothes. And these clothes are the badges of terrorists and the badges of oppression. What an appalling religion. How could we take it seriously? So for me, this is a huge challenge insofar as dealing with Islamophobia is concerned, is how to get away from not the more obvious forms of racism and xenophobia, which would be people, right-wing people chanting in crowds, but how to deal with the far more insidious because it is more subtle messaging that comes when mainstream media and mainstream governments write stories or pass laws that are deeply insidious but subtle background messages. And I think that's five minutes. Thank you so much, Neville. <laughs> I think you <clears throat> highlighted very clearly a discriminatory narrative that has been mainstreamed as a challenge. I think that's a very good concluding identification of of uh, of uh, um, of the challenge, uh, which really was uh, initially uh, mentioned by Leslie uh, when she referred to a particular kind of narrative that is based on an accumulated sense of loss and also a self and collective pride over and against the other and uh, in the form of Christian and Jewish Zionisms uh, with regard to the settler colonization of the Palestinian land and also in Brazil, how through religious fake news, how digitalization of that and mainstreaming it um, have uh, posed a big challenge to us. And this conversation itself is a kind of a brainstorming in a way, an awareness raising, how a, a, a kind of a similar pattern can be seen in these different contexts, but these different contexts are also interrelated. They don't exist on their own, now, we'll move on to the next uh, round. I would kindly invite uh, Leslie to reflect on within five minutes, if you could, uh, 
the responses, creative responses, and, and the opportunities that we have found and we are pursuing at the moment. Okay, Jude, thank you very much. Um, so what I've tried to do is um, to think of some ways that, in which we could uh, begin to become relevant uh, in the world in which we live in the public and the public square, the public debate in particular. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, the movie uh, Quo Vadis Eda, which is about the Bosnian war uh, when the Srebrenica, or sorry, when the Serbian army was um, about to take over Srebrenica, Ada was a teacher, and her job was to work with the UN as a translator and to help to bring pe the people of Srebrenica um, to some safety. Except that it wasn't. Now, if you ever go to see the movie, I would rec I would recommend first that you do, and secondly that you give yourself time to recover at the end of it. So don't be rushing off to do something that you have to actively participate in because it's a kind of a shocking movie to watch. But the story both highlights the difficulties um, of getting involved in the in in the public in a public way in the public square way, and also the importance of doing that. And it, it, for me, it speaks of the way of the cross, to be able to tolerate the pain of being between people. And that's something of a calling, to become, again, the people who bear the weight because of the one who carries all the weight. Courage, suffering, hope and humility are relevant as we seek to address challenges and grasp opportunities. So firstly, I think we need to find a way to become more relevant in a new way in the in the public square. It's not that there aren't faith things happening in the public square, there are. So Magali, you talked about fundamentalism. Um, so that's that's asserting itself all over the place. Neville, your commentary on how the public narrative can uh, skew a view of a faith community. Um, there, there is a lot going on already in the public narrative, but I do think the Christian churches in Northern Ireland labour under the belief that we are still relevant and that the conversation we're having is of no consequences. I, I work uh, amongst civil servants on a daily basis. I never hear faith mentioned. Never, never, never. Um, so the, the discussion about what churches, faith communities, people of any faith might be doing or saying or thinking or believing, it is simply of no, uh, not material for discussion on a daily basis. That's, uh, and it's particularly, I think, difficult for the Christian churches in Northern Ireland to become more relevant given our histories and the public perception that has developed over latter years. And that's where the humility comes in. We have to be conscious of the world in which we're living and the view that there might already be of us there and the why of, of people not talking about us. At the same time, without a voice or voices that can be heard with the respect required for real listening, we cannot even begin to shape the public narrative. So I think we need to look for new ways to do that. Secondly, I think, uh, as I said earlier, the public narrative no longer really grasps religious ideas that are so familiar to us. There are fewer people than ever within the four walls of a church building on a Sunday morning. There are fewer people than ever spending time in discussion about the churches. And where once, where once there might have been discussion about church statements, now it's pretty limited to the odd edition of Talkback and then to Sunday sequence on a Sunday morning. The language, therefore, isn't there for us to communicate clearly with each other. And yet, if you look at the public narrative, there are words with which we are familiar. Sometimes I'm struck by the use of words that are born for me in the world of theology, forgiveness, tolerance, grace, words like that. How, are they, how they're used in public documents and discussion documents is though different than how we would use them. So there is an opportunity there from the very fact that the words are out there in the public public discussion, there is an opportunity for us to begin um, to engage with those words and to invest meaning into them. And that will come from our own values and vision and the hope 
that we have for a dark world. I think there is a chance for us to re, re enliven public debate um, and the theological ideas that uh, that are there in word, but not in understanding things like scarcity and grace and how those two things stand against each other and, and can pull each other down, for example. And the third thing then I think is for, for leaders uh, to engage both ways. So when I say that the Christian churches in Northern Ireland labour under the misapprehension that we're still relevant, I think that partly comes from the fact that at government level and at the level of the pu of public service, so the civil service, for example, permanent secretaries, etc., they will engage very well and very regularly with the church leadership, and they want to hear from the church leadership, and that that I think leads us to believe that people are listening everywhere, but they're not. So they may be listening up the way, but they're not listening down the way. And that, that's how I see it anyway. So I think Christian leaders, therefore, who are who go out to do the engaging on behalf of denominations must also then engage, ba engage back into their own denomination, out in the public square, but back into the Christian community. Um, you mentioned Alec Reid. Um, Alec always went home to the Redemptorists and told them what was going on. And I am quite sure that that had a big um, effect on who the Redemptorists have become today. So we are shaped by that narrative coming back into us from our leaders as well. So I think we need to rebuild relationships. We need to take on the role of a listener. And um, we need to think more about what leadership means and be genuinely mindful of other faith communities um, as well. Courage such as that uh, of Ada, who worked alongside the United Nations and the resilience she had to had to demonstrate to bear the pain that that was all around her and indeed within her as her own family were taken away and murdered. And we have to come with humility because of our own histories and stories. How we speak matters. We cannot expect respect. We have to earn it. I think those are some of the things um, which are our responses, Jude. Thank you very much, uh, Leslie, uh, connecting it to uh, Father Alec. Uh, and you very clearly said one of the ways to overcome the challenges is to get involved in between people in the public square. That's exactly what Alec did. Over to you, Michael, would you kindly enlighten us on the lessons from the street of Father Alec? Uh, and I, I take on board Leslie's point about the limitations of, of a faith or Catholic perspective, um, but uh, there still might be something to be learned from Father Reed. Uh, he used to speak about lessons uh, from the streets so there weren't lessons from anywhere but the streets and his experience on the streets. And there were usually six of them, sometimes seven, four primary lessons and two secondary lessons building on the first four. Um, so basically, his first lesson was, you're not alone in peacemaking. Um, you know, this is uh, something that is done with the accompaniment of the Holy Spirit. So you can... Without me, you can do nothing, but with me, all things are possible. Uh, so more things are possible in Father Alec's vision uh, because the Holy Spirit is working with you. Um, so once when the Basque Spanish peace process was facing a serious and worrying difficulty, Father Alec said to a leader of the Basque left-wing patriots that they would overcome it with the help of the grace of God. And when this comment was translated for him by an interpreter who was, uh, he was speaking in Basque, the reply was translated to Alec as follows. He said to tell you to get as much of that as you possibly can. This is the grace of God. Suppose you're not working alone, which is maybe important for peacemakers who feel a little bit isolated. Um, so again, Alec was uh, a hurler. He spoke about the Holy Spirit and he, he believed the Holy Spirit was on the pitch. And I think, you know, no matter what religious tradition, uh, if you believe that God is with you in your work of, of peacemaking, uh, you, you know, it's maybe a, a help. So listen to the dignity of the human person is foundational uh, for, for Father Alec. As a human person, as a, 
as a human being, you are worthy of dignity. And I suppose as somebody who is saved, um, uh, you are even more uh, worthy of dignity if that's possible. So for Father Reed, that is the key, um, the dignity of the human person. Uh, using a person's name, thank you, showing appreciation, building relationship with human beings, other human beings. And I suppose um, dialogue is, is where that takes you um, and face-to-face -face communication between human beings, different human beings, all of whom are worthy of, of, of respect, no matter what historical, political, cultural differences. That, that exist. And, and next, listening is, is the most important activity of that dialogue. So it's, it's a journey into the world of, of the other. And I suppose creating places of dialogue where you can build relationship, places where it's safe, um, that's not easy in a world where there's immediate media reporting of everything. Um, you need confidential, safe places to build relationship and to learn about the other and, and maybe to risk learning about the other. Um, and that's very difficult to do with, with immediate access uh, to the World Wide Web. Um, so now <laughs> in a world where gender uh, politics and, and gender understandings are changing and have changed, uh, Father Alec actually was, was not quite as traditional as people might expect. Um, he would have said everybody, no matter how they self-identify, is, is worthy of respect. And, and really what he was saying when he was talking about the male-female dynamic is to give space to diversity and listen to diversity. And uh, he certainly, in the next uh, slide there, he would have seen it very important um, he would have thought that the peace process would have gone more quickly if there were more uh, women involved in politics and in the negotiations. Uh, and he was a person who worked very closely with his aunt Ita, who was his secretary for many years, and, and with many other uh, men and women. But he was really, I suppose, open to diversity and, and, and respecting diversity. And that individual respect for human dignity goes also to respects of the right of a, the rights of a community. So any community that can claim historical, political, cultural identity of its own has rights based on the dignity of the human person and on the respect that is due in justice to that dignity. So this is key. Um, it would have led him, if he had published this, uh, to um, conflict within his own Catholic church because for Father Alec, um, the dignity of the individual as a human person and as a child of God and the dignity uh, that must be shown in community, um, leaders in churches uh, must structure, uh, must have structures of dialogue in place and listening in place to listen to the Holy Spirit working in God's people. He, he was absolutely against an authority from above. And he was all about listening. And I suppose the story of Liz, um, there was conflict on Alec's side of the peace line, the Clonard side of the peace line one day. And Alec hadn't wandered over to the Shankill on the other side of the peace line. Um, and one day he decided to wander over and he knocked on the door of a house and, and the lady of the house opened the door and she was kind of shocked to see this man dressed in black. Um, and, and she kind of said, um, well, what are you doing here? And he explained and she said, do you want to come in? And she invited him in. And uh, as he walked in the door, he had never met this woman. He'd never been in this house. And he saw love one another uh, over her kitchen door. And on the next slide, he went in further uh, and he saw God answers prayers and the Lord is my shepherd. And he realized that this home of the other wasn't uh, a very strange place. And that if you took the risk to listen to, to respect, to journey towards the other, it could actually be a very enriching place to be. 
Um, but I think to have places where you can build relationship, where you can listen carefully and, and take a little bit of time and build trust, that I think is a lesson uh, that can be taken from Father Alex lessons into other parts of the world and into other places. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Um, you know, in the in the context of Ireland, at the at the present moment, uh, the the reflection is on how to bring the two communities together. Uh, and the focus is on forgiveness, reconciliation, and, and human dignity. But in the context of Palestine, when every day there is a death, more than one, the, the drive is end the occupation. And would you, Mitri, please come on board now? Yeah, thank you, Jude. Um, so what can we do, I guess, is the question. And uh, I would like to offer uh, four ideas uh, for reflection, maybe, and discussion. Uh, one is, um, you know, as a, as a Christian theologian uh, who did his studies uh, in Europe, uh, all my studies, uh, after coming back, and um, again, uh, you know, experiencing uh, on daily basis what Israeli occupation does to, to people and to bodies. Uh, uh, I think it is important to decolonize theology. The problem is that theology today is very much uh, actually something that was um, shaped by the empire. Uh, and the, the main question for me is, is the Bible a tool for liberation or colonization? Now, unfortunately, historically speaking, uh, the Bible was used in so many centuries as a tool for colonization. You know, in Africa, you know, they tell you, you know, uh, you know, the white missionary came with the Bible and told the blacks there, let us pray. And they started praying. And when they opened their eyes, the black had the Bible and the white had the land. Uh, I mean, so really, the, the, uh, we need to decolonize uh, 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 theology. Uh, and the other thing with theology is we need to liberate theology from the, you know, this spiritualization. You know, liberation became salvation and so on. But this wasn't the intention of the Bible. Why? Because actually the Bible was, is a book that was written by people over 1,000 years who were living under occurring empires, from the Assyrians to the Babylonians, to the Persians, to the Greek, to the Romans. I mean, think of this, that Jesus himself was actually born under occupation, lived his entire life under, under occupation as well, and was crushed on the cross by the power of occupation. And so this is how we need to understand these texts as actually texts of people who were oppressed, they are not text of oppressor, but the moment the Bible became the text of the oppressor, it became a tool for settler colonialism. Uh, um, so this is the first idea. The second uh, important thing I think we can do is we need to empower our people by uh, creating room for them to tell their story the way they want to tell us. You know, as Palestinian, often our story was told by others. Uh, and our story was distorted by the media. And you know, part of settler colonialism actually to, uh, if you want to keep settler colonialism, uh, you have to stereotype those who 
whom you are pushing out by calling them savage, backward, terrorists, etc. Because only then, you know, you can have a good conscience by actually kicking them out. And so it's high time to give uh, uh, to give space for people, the oppressed people, to tell their story, um, and to keep, to tell to give them tools to do it in a creative way. And this is why, for example, at our university, we really wanted to invest uh, in in arts and culture as the tools for social transformation. So uh, helping our people to tell their story through film, through music, through theater. This is so powerful because it humanizes them. You know, today again, these nine, now there are 10 people who were assassinated in cold blood by the Israeli military. You know, these people who have names, they have families, they have kids, they have mothers, they have stories. They are not numbers, it's not 10. And so we need to tell these stories. You know, if it were a Jewish person who was called only one, you will have his own story and a nice picture of him and his, you know, his, his wife will be crying. And, and, and Palestinians, they don't deserve even one sentence in the newspaper because this assassination, this lynching of Palestinians has become a daily thing that Israel is doing with impunity. And so this will bring me to the third uh, issue, which is really we have to resist the imperial structures, not the people. You know, our problem is not with Jews as such. Our problem is with an imperial structure of oppression that wants to eliminate us. That's our problem. And these structures we have to unmask as, as structures of oppression. And we, we have to name these uh, structures by name, you know. So now human rights organizations are telling us what's happening in Palestine on both sides of the green line is apartheid. But politicians are not using the word. Church leaders are afraid to use this word. But human rights organizations, including Jewish human rights organizations, Beth Salem, Human Rights Watch, uh, uh, you, know, you name it, uh, uh, Amnesty International are saying this is apartheid. So naming the structures by name, settler colonialism is important because people understand the structure, it's not about the people. And the last thing is we need to widen and to invest more in creating networks. Because you know, our story is not only a Palestinian story. <laughs> our story is the story of so many indigenous people in Brazil, in Latin America, in South Africa, in Australia, in New Zealand, you name it. Everywhere where the empires went, you know, that's the story. And so uh, those who are with us are actually more than those who are against us, but we are not yet uh, organized. And so organizing our people understand that, you know, including, you know, network with, with Jewish human rights organization who understand the oppression and are ready to resist it. This is so important because only together we can work towards a better future so that all can have life and can have it abundantly and not only the 1% right now who are really, you know, uh, uh, you know, controlling uh, over 90% of, uh, you know, the wealth of the world. Thank you very much, Mitri, for emphasizing the need to come together. Magali, it's your turn now, please. Thank you. Um, I'd like to share three opportunities for churches in partnership with public agents concerning the issues I brought in my first presentation. Three opportunities. First, in the field of human relations and social policies, the search for urgent ways to pacify families and religious groups. There is a very serious social fracture in Brazil, and a pacification process will be necessary. That involves educational, affective processes to promote a culture of peace, dialogue, tolerance, 
and also the judicial accountability of those who promote hatred and violence in the social, political, and religious field. It's very urgent in Brazil to publicize public condemnation of armament, of the logic of self-defense and revenge, and pressure for disarmament policies. Lula's government in its first weeks in January has been developing processes to humanize politics, but at the same time, searching to avoid impunity and apply punishments to domestic terrorists who had been acting freely. This is important, fair, and educational. And churches need to be together with the public agents. Also, there is opportunity to support or create international articulations, networks like Mitri has just mentioned, for the mapping of fair right groups, especially those that act in the context of religions, in order to understand their articulations, their capacity for action, their sources of funding. These people have a lot of money to act, and thus collaborate with groups that act for rights regionally to devise coping strategies based on these profiles. The Ecumenical movement can be, for example, one of these privileged articulations. The third uh, opportunity I see in the field of communication, it is necessary to act mainly in two fronts. First, understanding the processes of convincing people exploited by the extreme right especially those who make use of religion, seeking to understand more deeply the relationship between people and religion, and the place of religion in the everyday life, establishing meaning and interacting with other processes of existence. Progressive groups inside and outside the churches urgently need to understand this process the relationship between people and religion, and the place of religion in daily life, and seek strategic ways to confront Christian Zionism and its ideology, taking into account the historical appeal to the place of Israel at the base of Christian tradition, and the black male surrounding criticism to the current state of Israel as anti-Semitism. Still in the field of communication, support projects to tackle misinformation, disinformation, by publicizing the work of fact-checking agencies and acting on social pressure for legislation that holds accountable digital platforms that profit from lies and hate give special attention to segmented disinformation circulating in religious environments. And one last note, we need to evaluate this phenomena of the advance of far-right movements linked to religion by naming them as they mean extremism, far-right, fundamentalism, new stage of imperialism, new stage of colonization. Some approaches bring softness to these movements, classifying the phenomena as populism. It diverts reflection and action to the challenge of just and peace with... Uh, let's, as Magali got frozen, let's move on to Neville. And thank you very much, Magali, for identifying very concretely how the churches uh, and the faith communities can engage in the public square in between people. And over to you, Neville, to uh, enlighten us on the possibilities uh, and, and the opportunities against the challenges. <clears throat> Okay, and so I'm going to return to the challenge that I faced, or that I mentioned originally, which is the concept of Islamophobia, but this applies more generally in terms of the position of people of various religions who find themselves uh, op 
oppressed in particular countries. For me, the challenge <clears throat> is the same as one of the biggest problems. The challenge should be, or the way, I'm sorry, the, 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 the response and the, the solution should be uh, when we thought through the language of human rights, which is the world's first international legal language and which is posited as potentially the sort of uh, a panacea to all our, our, our ills. The difficulty is, in fact, it seems to me, uh, both in Europe and beyond, the internationalization of human rights has, in fact, been part of the problem here. And I mentioned this in two particular contexts. The first context is in relation to the approach of the European Court of Human Rights, wherever freedom of religion is concerned. And we've seen this in cases, for example, where women who have been prohibited from wearing certain forms of Islamic kind have challenged this in the European Court of Human Rights, claiming that this represents, their, uh, represents a violation of their right to freedom of religion also challenged in the Court of Justice of the European Union, where what we're dealing is with, the, is, is, with is the refusal to allow women to wear garments in the workplace. In all of these contexts, these claims have been rejected uh, and been rejected pretty much out of hand by the European Court of Human Rights. And <clears throat> this is because it seems to me that where religion is mentioned, the European Court of Human Rights, which fears for its own future legitimacy, has in effect vacated the playing field. It claims that there is a right to freedom of religion. It claims that it has a jurisdiction over this, but it gives it no force whatsoever, virtually always deferring to what the national state wants to do and taking, uh, from, as it were, at face value, some fairly ludicrous claims that national states have made in defense of their laws. It engages with it, in other words, in no meaningful way. And I've no difficulty, or would have no difficulty, uh, with the idea of the European Court of Human Rights saying religion is too controversial for us, we cannot properly monitor or supervise uh, a right to freedom of religion, but that's not what it does. What it does is that it continues to pretend that it is enforcing the right to freedom of religion, whereas in reality it simply gives it no substance whatsoever. And in doing so, it has massively impoverished the concept of freedom of religion in Europe. And that for me is a huge challenge uh, insofar as the legitimacy of human rights in Europe is concerned. At an international level, moreover, I think there's a, a potentially an even greater problem when we look at what the United Nations Human Rights Committee has done in relation to, for example, freedom of religion and in relation to freedom of expression. Because what it has done is it's taken a particular view of how states should be organized on an entirely secular ideal, probably an American style secular ideal rather than a French style secular ideal and has presented this as if it was of universal validity. So, for example, it said that insofar as the right to freedom of expression is concerned, whereas according to the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and all the human rights treaties, it's legitimate to restrict freedom of expression in the name of public morals, which from the perspective of states that endorse religion would include things like blasphemy laws, the United Nations Human Rights Committee has said that your public morality cannot be made up of an exclusively religious tradition. Now, there's no basis whatsoever in any of the human rights treaties that would justify this conclusion. And the risk is that the International Human Rights Committee has got a particular vision of what religion is, something that should be done in private, something that shouldn't have any kind of public impact and shouldn't really dominate people's worldviews, that's something for the slightly odd, the religious, and it's presented the alternative vision, the secular vision, as if it was the only game in town. This is again problematic because it seems to me that for those groups who are marginalized on the basis of their religion, the concept of freedom of religion and the concept of the autonomy of the person is hugely important. The international human rights treaties provided ammunition for this kind of claim to be made at both a local and at an international setting but it's been robbed of any meaningful force by the very bodies who are supposed to be enforcing it. So the challenge, it seems to me, is to bring the concept of freedom of religion, to make the meaningful concept of freedom of religion continue to have force, but it can't have any force the way in which it's currently being supervised and monitored, both in Europe and internationally. And again, I'm sorry, sorry but I hope it's been five minutes. Thank you much, Neville, uh, for going back and forth from the international treatises and the way in which uh, that they are, you know, treated or not treated uh, in the in the established uh, European codes and how we could intervene 
uh, in, in different fora with regard to this. Now, as we are running short of time, I would not really uh, pose the questions. There are few on the chat box, but I would really like each one of you kindly to take one minute each uh, and uh, make a brief uh, comment, a suggestion, a reflection as a concluding, uh, you know, a, a remark. Uh, would uh, Leslie kindly um, take one minute? There, there are many different concepts that are colliding or not colliding in the public square. Um, I, I'm taken with your um, your human rights stuff, Neville. Um, so meanings at issue, um, the meaning of what what we're doing, um, and the meaning of concepts that are out there, and also then with um, the the history and the weight of knowledge, experience, and wisdom that we have from our histories that we're missing. Hope that's enough, Jude. Thank you. And Michael? I suppose I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for trustworthy people who are working for peace. And um, I suppose in a world where international agreements are made and, and then somebody or countries step out of these international agreements willy-nilly. Um, I think being trustworthy and being honorable and actually um, willing to enter into honorable, trustworthy relationship with other groups and, and other countries is actually something to be grateful for. So thank you for the trustworthiness and the, the integrity that's uh, obvious here. Thank you very much, Michael. Mitri? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I was thinking of what uh, Neville said about human rights and so on, uh, because, you know, unfortunately, mm -hmm. when it comes to Christian Zionism and Jewish Zionism, uh, divine rights trump human rights. And I feel we are in an age where, you know, all the human rights uh, and, and conventions and so on uh, that were created after the Second World War uh, are somehow right now being questioned by this populism and, and Christian Zionism and so on. And so uh, I guess keeping somehow divine rights and human rights together is something for the future would be really important because uh, I, I think as Christians who believe that um, the divine became human, which means every human life is, is sanctified. And I think this we need this today maybe more than ever. Thank you very much, uh, Mitri. Um, I would like to make a, a, a brief reflection, starting with uh, Leslie, who reiterated the importance of getting involved in between people of course, it varies from context to context, what it means by in between people in the public square. And I could see pastorally how that engagement was made uh, true uh, by, by Alec Reed. And then we could see how uh, Mitri focused on how the task has to be multi-dimensional, uh, theological, pastoral, letting people speak out, prophetic, and then unmasking uh, the empire, uh, and then networking. And Magali concretely identified what steps could be taken proactively, decisively, particularly in the digital uh, world. And I'm coming to Neville, uh, who reiterated the need to uh, highlight the importance of different nuances of religious traditions and how these could be taken seriously by international uh, mechanisms and regimes of human rights. Neville, you have one minute to, to reflect on, please. So I'm 
the one non-theologian here. And so I'm going to give you one thought on religion. And I'm, again, this is not my expertise, but it's this. I think there are two choices if religion is going to be useful and contribute to peace building, as it seems to be the source of uh, anger and warfare. Either you recapture the concept of humility, uh, uh, which is very difficult because it seems to me that insecurity and arrogance tend to be the flip side of each other within the human uh, experience. But if you go into the business of religion without actually saying, I could be wrong and I'm probably wrong on most things because I'm dealing with something which is vastly beyond my comprehension, then you're going to have the awfulness of people thinking that God's in their sight and therefore why shouldn't they blow up the enemy because they're an enemy of God. If that's impossible, if humility, genuine humility of belief, genuine acceptance of the very substantial possibility that you might be wrong, if that's impossible, then the only true way, I think, to peace is to abolish religion. I would not have that view. Thank you very much, Neville, uh, for that very useful insight. And thank you very much to all our panelists uh, for giving their time and energy. Sadly, uh, we are we are we have lost Magali due to technical reasons. And thank you very much for all the participants for staying. I'm back. You're back, Magali. Sorry, could you kindly give one minute uh, as as a concluding remark, please? No, just thank you. I don't know what happened with my audio. It, I lost you, uh, but I could see you, couldn't listen to you. But now I'm back just to say thank you. I learned a lot. Sorry for not listening to what you said by, by then, by concluding remarks, but I learned a lot with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And to everybody uh, for, for participating. And thank you, Jean. Thank you, Dermot for organizing this event. And there are other webinars, uh, which the Irish School of Ecumenics is organizing, and you will be notified about the future events. Uh, and as a way of conclusion from my side, uh, I would like to reiterate that there is a need to network as Mitri highlighted, because the challenges we face are, are common, but in a way, contextually experienced. And there's a need to also learn lessons from each other. And there is a task, which is not a single task, which has multiple aspects. It's theological, it's legal, and also it's pastoral. And these aspects have come to the fore in our conversation, and let's keep uh, getting connected to one another. And also those of you who have questions, you can send to the same email address th uh, that, that uh, you, you got the uh, invitation and we will forward those questions to the particular panelist. And have a very good evening and thank you to everybody. <laughs>